Welcome to the latest Blue Deal debate, when we discuss our seas, our fish, our fishing industry, the marine environment. I'm Chris Davis, uh, a former chair of the European Parliament's Fisheries Committee and a senior advisor with Rudd Pedersen Public Affairs in Brussels. And it thanks to sponsorship from Rudd Pedersen and their team that today we're discussing the issue of the landing obligation, the so-called ban on the discards of fish, and the new measures being proposed by the European Commission to introduce controls on the way in which fishing is carried out. That's very topical because although the Commission actually proposed this legislation back in 2018, the European Parliament has only just voted on it uh, within the past few weeks. The Council, that's the governments of Europe, has yet to come up with its opinion. And then of course, the, the two sides will go into negotiations through a behind the scenes trilogue of, of negotiators to try and come up with the, 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 the final outcome. And no doubt the European Commission will be doing its very best to make sure that that final outcome reflects the position it took in the in the first place. Right. Well, with me, I would like to introduce some of my guests. And that's uh, from the European Commission, two heads of unit, Valerie Tankink, sorry, Valerie, <laughs> uh, Tankink, and Francesca Arena. From, um, uh, well, from the European Parliament now, but formerly from WWF, uh, Yannicka Borg, uh, a marine biologist. And um, from LIFE, that's the Low Impact Fishers for Europe, Brian O'Riordan. Brian, just to just explain, what is a low impact fisher? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, LIFE was uh, launched in 2012 on the eve of the new uh, common fishing policy, the 2014 uh, reform process. And that highlighted a major difference between what was considered small scale, uh, vessels below a certain size using non-towed gear and the larger scale vessels essentially using trawls and other mobile gears. So it was quite apparent that uh, the whole issue of small scale fishing really hadn't been given proper consideration in previous CFPs. And at last in 2014, there was an opportunity for the small scale uh, fishers to come together and make their voices heard. Well, and one just, thing, one thing uh, they uh, wanted to make clear was that um, impact on the seabed, impact on the fish stocks can all be reduced by using gear that is selective and works away from the seabed. So this, in pass, essence, pass, pass, is passive gear. Is that right? Not passive gear, gear. non-towed. It's described in um, the um, EMFF or the MFF as it is now as vessels under 12 meters using non-towed gears. So yeah, non-towed gear is passive gear, hooks, lines, um, nets, uh, uh, okay. generally which work off the seabed. Let me just say that. So that's a, that probably represents the vast majority of the people that actually call themselves fishermen in terms of numbers but they only catch about 5% of the total fish because the big commercial, the big industrial boats, if you like, are the, uh, are the real catchers. That's right. We're talking about uh, fishing operations, probably one, two people on board. They fish for 12 hours, possibly less, maybe as long as 24 hours, but they're just fishing in the coastal waters and they're bringing their fish fresh back to port landing okay. a few kilos a day. But as you say, it's about 5% of the catch overall, according to the STEC statistics, and 70% of the fleet, uh, around 50% uh, of the employment. Obviously, that varies from sea basin to sea basin. Grand. OK, thanks very much for, for that. Now, let's put our debate into context. Uh, it's about 10 years ago that there was a big campaign uh, which highlighted the fact that it is normal practice for fishermen to discard, to throw overboard, to pump out uh, fish that they, they don't want to land for, for a variety of reasons. And this caused a lot of outrage. I mean, people were just horrified that perfectly good protein, if you like, was being caught, killed and just thrown away. Uh, and that led to uh, proposals being included in the reform package for the common fisheries policy to introduce a landing obligation to require fishermen to, to, uh, to bring everything to, uh, to port. Now, the rest of that uh, regulation was intended to promote sustainability, to ensure that we will start rebuilding our fish stocks. And it's been remarkably, remarkably successful, I think, over the last decade in, in doing that. Fish stocks are at a much greater level than they were a decade or, or more before. 
But the landing obligation, well, that's a that's a different matter. So tell me, um, who should we go to? Let's uh, uh, go to Yannicka. Yannicka, why why uh, why do fishermen throw fish overboard? It makes no sense. Well, um, as not being a representative for the fisheries sector, um, from my point of view, it's a business. It's a business, and and you need to make this business lucrative and. Um, why would you throw over fi overboard fish? Well, <laughs> that fish is not the one you want to catch or it's, uh, it's not the, the proper quality of fish. This is a bit backwards, though, because the main point uh, that I think everyone in this room, but also everyone who works with this issue, is that we want fishing to be able to continue and we want it to be able to continue long term. So this is why we're having these uh, discussions and this is why we are having all of these um, landing obligations, uh, the CFP, we're working on it to, to make sure that we can do this, not just for the next 15 or 20 years, but in fact, for the next 50 and 100 years. And I just wanna have this said at the start of this discussion, this is what where we all start at, and I'm sure we can all agree on this point, how we do it and where we shall restrict it. That's, I guess, where the debate starts. Valerie, how much fish was being over, over thrown, thrown overboard? I don't have the figure right here, but just to uh, to follow up on what Anika said in your question on why do people throw fish overboard, it's very much, there's different reasons. And what we're really trying to see is the difference between on what gets into that, really trying to move to more selective fishing and finding ways to incentivize through the regulations, but also other ways that uh, fishermen choose the most selective gear that there is and that's so that they only land what is really unavoidable. So the proposal was, to the discard ban, the landing obligation, was to try and ensure that it was less waste, to try and ensure there was more selective use of fishing gear so that you weren't catching the fish you didn't that didn't have commercial value. And of course, you also wanted good st statistical information so that scientists could assess the state of the fish stocks better. Yeah, yeah, no, indeed. And uh, when I say, see figures saying that, you know, millions of tons, I mean, substantially more than a million tons of fish were being thrown it, ab overboard in this way, is that figure realistic? Uh, well, we're looking at the moment, the, f the figure at the time, that was the best est estimates that were there at the time, of course, of the reform. We are looking at the moment to get better figures. It's still very difficult to have a, an accurate p picture of how much is really thrown overboard. Um, we, yeah, That's something we're, we're trying to deepen because in the end, it's, it all starts with, with good knowledge and knowing what's the real situation. And there is still some way to go there. But when the legislation had gone through the whole lawmaking process, it, it wasn't a simple, you must land everything. There were exceptions, weren't there? What, 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 I mean, it's quite messy, really. So what's allowed, what's allowed to be thrown overboard and what's not? Well, there, is, there was a whole process introduced with the regulation, uh, slowly uh, stepping into the landing obligation, uh, starting uh, with the Baltic and then slowly uh, going on to, to other fisheries. Um, the, we, we, in the run-up, and so the, the introduction of the landing obligation, in fact, took from 2015 till 2019. So it's only been two years that we had the full rollout and the landing obligation applicable everywhere. Uh, what, uh, in, in principle, you need to land everything for quotas, uh, species subject to quotas. Um, then, of course, there, the, the way the uh, regulation has been designed, the way the system has been designed, there are ways to, to deal with specificities for cases where there are unwanted bite catches, for cases where we want to avoid choke situations where the fish, fisheries has to stop because, because of bite catches for which there's not enough quota, uh, and really find a way to adapt it to the regional specificity. One thing that is important with the introduction of the landing obligation, it came together with the regionalization. So really, this, the reform we had in 2013 has been quite a turning the CFP upside down, uh, not only by introducing the landing obligation, which is a huge new thing that uh, it needs to be introduced, but also by bringing a system whereby the implementation of the policy is much closer to the sea basins and to the specificities of each fishery. But we've seen okay. clearly that takes time. Huh? <laughs> yes, well, you know, in the end, we're all dead. So how much time does it take? Um, 
Um, well, the fish, fish stocks are doing well, huh? That's what you started in the beginning. Indeed, in the indeed. end, that's no, what we're aiming for. So, yeah, well, I think on the one on the one hand, you know, you can't you can't chant. Well, the, the evidence is there that uh, the the policies of the European Union have changed, have improved. Fish stocks are are, are getting better. Commercial fish stocks are, are getting better. That's 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 the good side. Um, the bad side, I suppose, is the moral argument. You know, the 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 the, the ethics of of, of just. Of, of killing things and having no use for them. Um, let me turn to uh, Yannicka here because the, the, you know, you're a marine biologist. One of the exceptions is that you're allowed to throw back, I think I'm right here, Valerie, you're allowed to throw back fish that will live. But how much fish does live after it's been caught in a net and crushed and dragged on board a boat? Yeah, so this really comes down to the gear that you're using, the different gear. Uh, have different survival rates, uh, but also depends on the fish. So there are studies that say that, for example, salmon species uh, are better at surviving, for example, after being even lifted out of the water, uh, whereas some other species are, are take uh, damage instantly. So it's hard, it's hard to give an overall answer. It has to go down to the, the species level. But what's more important here is to start moving into more selective gear. So that's something we haven't seen yet. Uh, enough, I think. Um, we're still using gear that um, are not very selective in which fish they take up. And then you will end up with a situation where you in fact land a lot of uh, what we call bycatch. It might be species that could be used, but you don't want to use them. Or it's in fact species that you're not allowed to land. They're, they're uh, endangered species or they're species that are too, too small. So this is a development that we really need. Uh, to make sure that we come away from this discussion of should we throw it overboard? When when can we do that? And when can we? Can the bigger fishing fleets, in particular, the the the, the high end impact fishes, could they be using more selective gear? Yes, uh, of course, Chris. I think you're aware that uh, trawl nets can be adapted with square mesh panels and. Uh, uh, various devices you fit in the net which uh, separate uh, different parts of the catch uh, say separating shrimps from uh, round fish uh, flat fish from from round fish and so on but often uh, the investment necessary in these devices is significant and even when there is uh, money available to fit these devices we find that there are little tricks that uh, the industry use in order to negate the effects of these selectivity devices because there is, as was explained earlier, there is a commercial incentive. Fishermen are out there to uh, generate a profit um, with the increasing price of, of, of fuel or uncertainty of price of fuel and other factors. There is an incentive to um, try and uh, negate the selectivity of these gears and certainly uh, members of life have uh, reported they notice particularly in, in the baltic um, use of a, a rope which is put through the square mesh panel and a very simple slip knot which can be untied uh, so if you're controlled the rope is slipped the square mesh panel opens but if you're not controlled then the square mesh panel is closed so selectivity devices are there there are gears by controlling your mesh size by controlling how the the, the net is hung in the water all of these kinds of things contribute to selectivity i i, I brian I've, I've never heard that before i've never never heard i've heard it said that you know the selective gear still needs to be developed Sometimes I heard the money argument, although Valerie will probably point out that we have the European Maritime Fisheries Fund, which can support this. But I've never heard someone, especially from the fishing industry, saying that fishermen are deliberately not using selective gear as they could use it. Yes, I think that, that's right. I mean, it's a, it's a shame to say it. I'm not saying that all fishermen are, are, are cheats necessarily, but um, yes, I mean, it's the difference between thinking, well, I can get away with it today um, there's no one going to check me and uh, it's going to earn me a few uh, extra euros and, and, and getting away with it. OK, that's well, certainly interesting. But tell us, on the landing obligation, Valerie, what happens to the fish when it's landed? Because, you know, people say, well, frankly, they know the, the, the fish that for which there's no commercial value is simply not wanted. There's no use for it. 
Well, the, well, it depends on on which fishery, which region, and all that. But roughly, there are there are three groups. There are the the species they land that they want to sell and have a market for. There is the species they uh, land that are above the minimum conservation reference size, so are marketable. And if there is no market, it is to find find new markets so there I, there have been projects and studies and in cer for certain fisheries or certain regions they have been able to find new markets but again this comes it it costs money and it's it's a question of people wanting to go there and 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 having uh, moving there and is this this, and is, then, this is national governments is it rather than european commission that should be doing this exactly this is the member states very much and and as well as the the sector itself and and the producer organizations all together in in finding the way forward there is also a big part of of fish landed which is under the conservation uh, reference size that cannot be used for human consumption and that goes mainly into fish meal and that kind of uh, uh uses well so, just tell us i mean it used to be said I, I, i'm not sure whether it should be brian Val or unica to, to, to respond to this it used to be said that one of the reasons that fishermen threw their fish overboard was because they were over quota they'd already caught their limits and they weren't allowed they could be penalized if they landed it or because it was undersized and again they would be penalized if it was if they landed it are they still penalized because you know they're they're, ne they're never going to obey the law if they're going to be penalized for keeping the law if you see what i mean yeah, was, I mean, uh, uh, maybe maybe uh, valerie first well, the of course uh, the the incentive to land if it costs you that's something, uh, and that's the whole difficulty on on how to control or how to get the the fishermen to comply. But uh, yeah, I mean they have to uh, the the rules are there to to land everything, and uh, yeah. So they don't get they don't get financially penalised for the for the for, for the for landing fish, which is well, it's not. It, well, it's at a cost, of course, because if you land, if you throw the fish overboard, it doesn't cost you anything. If you land it in compliance with the rules, you have to do something with it. And if you cannot market it at good prices, of course, it will cost you probably more than if you land, uh, catch only the ones for which you have a market. The, the, the reality is here, of course, that it's, it goes hand in hand in what member states do in, in, in helping on uh, in market outlets, in, in finding ways to, to market the fish as well as to control if there's no control the cost of landing surely is bigger than than not respecting the rules and brian your your fishers they're if they land if they're landing fish that you know they're not going to be able to put on the market what what do they do with it well the thing is chris you've got to realize that the whole way the quota system is set up and run works against the interest of the small guys um the um under 12 meter fleets using selective gear because the quota is now basically concentrated. 90%, uh, 95% of the quota is concentrated in the hands of relatively few operators. So for a small scale guy going out to fish, he's either fishing non-quota species, which essentially means things like crab, uh, lobster, other kinds of shellfish, using a very selective technique like uh, potting where you don't get any bycatch or if you do, it's uh, alive and you can throw it back. Or if you're using nets and you're fishing for some kind of non-quota species, as soon as you catch anything which is a quota species and you don't have a quota, you are penalized. So what do you do? You either tie up and don't go fishing or you go fishing, uh, assuming that you're going to be able to get away with it. So either you go bankrupt or you break the law. I mean, that's what the landing obligation does for the small guy. But what, what, what choice is that? Well, if, I, if I can step in there, because uh, it, 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 that's a reality, huh? and uh, we see that as well. But uh, the, the allocation of the quotas, I mean, that's a competence for the member states to really see how to best allocate. And so finding ways of better distributing or finding ways to better manage it, manage that that is something that that we're we're trying strongly to encourage and in some member states that is working better than others uh, because 
in the end, it comes down to making sure the quota is allocated where, where it is needed most. But there again, there is also interest, commercial interest, and in every member state, the system functions different in that manner. Yeah, my, my criticism wasn't aimed at the commission, Valerie. Um, no, it is a, a fact of life that that is the system yeah. that we have in place, and it does work against the interests of the small guy, as, as as many other factors. I mean, we do hope, perhaps we'll come on to that later, um, Article 17, which does provide some uh, opportunity, if used effectively, to try and buck that trend. But anyway, sorry, I just wanted to yeah, I, 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 reassure I, 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 you. Just, just re the reference to Article 17 for those who haven't read the Common Fisheries Policy in, in detail is a short paragraph which basically says that national governments can uh, can can find means of encouraging low impact fishers and and uh, and, and good ways of, of of fishing and very few, if any, have done anything about it. I think that's the point Brian wants to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, yep. Yannicka, um, Yannicka, uh, the, um, the the landing obligation ten years on. Mm. Well, is it working? It would if it would be implemented. I mean, it's 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 a good it's a good piece of legislation, but it's not implemented. And what's interesting just now when I listen to Brian and Valerie talk is that there's a catch twenty two in this. Um, we need to know what kind of fish uh, we get out of the sea or crabs what we are fishing. We need to know what we lift out of the sea to be able to make proper assessments. We need this information to be able to make the assessments to know what we have under the surface. Um, but, but then at the same time, as Brian said, uh, there is um, a systematic error, if you will, will uh, that is in fact encouraging the fishers not to bring everything on board. Uh, so, so this, you know, it, it's, a, it's a chicken and an egg question. Uh, on, on how do we get the very important information from under the surface about our fish stocks that we need to be able to manage our fisheries when they are in fact not helping us. Um, years ago, uh, a decade ago, I uh, started out as a diver and the first thing they teach you when you become a professional diver is that diving is the most expensive method of collecting data, so uh, good luck getting employed. And this is something we see now, uh, you know, we are talking about fish which are in fact under the sea and we don't... Simply allowing good protein to be thrown overboard, that there will be a discard, discard ban, a landing obligation. And 10 years on, it's not in place. I mean, because member states, governments are not enforcing the rules. Fishermen are not obeying the rules. Europesh, the voice of the, really the voice of the, of the major fishing industry, says it's unworkable. I mean, maybe it's unworkable because its own members aren't making it work. Maybe because governments, maybe the legislation is badly framed. I, I don't know, but one way or another, Yannicka, you, you would agree it's not working, is it? Uh, today it's not working because it's not implemented. Uh, the intention is good, but the but, but if there's no if there's no market for the fish, I mean, what's the difference between throwing a, a, a fish that's dead back in the sea where it will be eaten by something, of getting a fish that's dead and landing it on board where or, on on land where or rot? So um, there are markets on land that you can in fact use these fish for, but it's not the most lucrative market. Um, and as we heard, some of them end up in, in fish meal. Uh, so yes, it's not what every fisher, fisher would like to do when, when you're in fact trying to survive and, and, and making a living of fishing. You don't want to bring in a, a lower quality product. Um, the, to answer your question, Chris, whether it should be thrown overboard where it's eaten, well, it's still dead. You know, it's, it's, a, it's in the food chain, it's in the ecosystem, it is, the protein stays there, but it's still a dead fish that affects the fish stocks. And especially if it was an undersized fish that didn't uh, mature before it was caught and killed, then it doesn't do its part in upkeeping the fish stock and, and making sure that we have a sustainable fishing. So we need to be able to um, control this part. And this is, again, why I mentioned about the selective gears, because we have the selective gears. And Brian, I'm quite shocked to hear you say that they are there, but the fishers are not using them. So I would like to hear from you. How, how can we make sure that they, they start using them? I understand it's a business. Is there any other opportunity than just having more surveillance on board of the ships? I'm going to bring Brian in. You mentioned control, though, Yannicka, uh, and uh, um, Francesca, who's dealing with control, with control regulation, has been very quiet there, so I shall bring her in a moment. Brian, have you got a quick response to, to Yannicka's, uh, Yannicka's point? Well, I think probably the incentives for using selective gears aren't there. I mean, if 
there was an incentive for fishermen to use them, then I'm sure they would be using them. I mean, they are there, um, but yeah, the question remains, uh, why aren't they using them? I'm afraid I don't really have any answer to that. I, sh I should emphasize, Chris, that um, I mean, our organization is a membership organization. We don't represent the entire fishing sector. We represent our members. And the members of LIFE have, in fact, signed up to a commitment to fishing in a low impact way. Um, not all segments of the fishing industry have done that. Yeah, thank you. Very, thanks, thanks for that, because our next debate will be on the Mediterranean, the, you know, perhaps the most overfished mm. sea in the world, and where there was a lot of small scale fishers who are no doubt in one way or another contributing and, and need to be, uh, you know, we need to find uh, solutions which, which bring them uh, into line and on board. Valerie, just before I, I move on, this issue of, um, you know, the fact is there is nothing to do with the fit, some of this fish when it's landed because it's not commercially valuable. If member states, if member state governments wanted to wanted to, to take uh, advantage of the, of the funding that's available from the European Union, if they wanted to, to create some sort of greater incentive for fishermen to land the fish, could, could they do so? Are there any yes. good examples? Yes, we. I mean, the the current. So we have the currently the EMFF, which provides for opportunities, and now we uh, we are working on the, on the future fund, so MFAF, which was uh, politically agreed uh, just before the end of last year, and w which will soon be adopted. And in in our discussions with the member states, we're very much seeing on how they can include concrete funding in their operational programs for uh, also for uh, for these issues of course the landing obligation falls into the bigger picture of the sustainable fisheries so we're trying to see at the different elements what they can do concretely the funds i mean they can provide for for funding for more selective techniques but there's also ways of of providing funding for for the marketing size of or the processing uh, these kind of angles okay Thank you. Okay, Francesca, let me bring you in on the on the control regulation, which is uh, you know, currently uh, being, I suppose, in in the legislative process. We've discussed here about the, the need to get accurate information about the total catch, whether it's landed or or, or discarded, in order that uh, we can continue down the sustainability path and rebuild fish stocks. What information are skippers supposed to provide in their in their logbooks, for example? What are they supposed to provide by way of information at the moment and what are they not providing? Yeah, so thank you, Chris. Uh, well, the, uh, the legislation is quite clear on what skippers need to provide irrespective of the landing obligation. All skippers are supposed to record uh, what they have caught and what they have discarded. So even if they don't land fish, but the fish is discarded, since the entry into force of the landing obligation, they should clearly record what they have discarded, up to 50, more than 50 kilograms uh, per, per species. Uh, one thing I wanted to, uh, to add to the discussion we just had before is, uh, on, I mean, there is an issue about the selectivity of, uh, of gears. But there is an issue about the configuration of fishing vessels. Uh, we've seen in our, our audits and inspections that certain vessels, uh, and specifically the demersal vessels, are configured in such a way that discarding uh, is, uh, is automatic, is the normal practice. So you need to have human intervention actually to pick up the fish and to retain it on board. Uh, no, no, no. You have to, you have, you have to, you have to explain that because, uh, I mean, those for those of us who don't know what uh, what life on board a fishing boat is actually like will understand that. So when yeah, you say so that actually set there up, are, there, there are certain vessels uh, which uh, are set up in such a way that once you bring fish on board, they are automatically discarded unless there is a human intervention to retain the catches on board. So they're done. I mean, this is a reflection of the past, eh, of uh, I mean, the, the the era before the landing obligation that really changed completely uh, the dynamics. Eh? So that's where I mean, I think we, there is much more to be done, um, and the control, the focus of control has changed, and why it has changed, because the the way it is. So you need to know exactly what is happening on board and what is happening at the time of catches, which we don't know to a large extent today. 
Okay, and now you're going to explain what measures you think need to be introduced in order to improve that situation. But before you do, uh, let me just take a, a few moments at halfway point just to uh, explain to those who've uh, tuned in recently that uh, we have with us from the European Commission two heads of units, that's Valerie Tankink and Francesca Arena. We have uh, from the from LIFE, the Low Impact Fishers for Europe, the Executive Secretary, that's Brian O'Regan, and uh, from the European Parliament, uh, but formerly of WWF, we have uh, Yannicka, uh, Yannicka Borg. So thank you very much. By the way, this uh, webinar, this Blue Deal debate is taking place thanks to the sponsorship of, of Rudd Pedersen Public Affairs. We are open to other sponsors, let me say, because I, I, I enjoy these discussions and uh, I'd like someone to facilitate some more of them. And uh, if you wish to uh, send in a question on the chat box, please do. And uh, in half an hour's time, we'll try and address those that are sent in. So thanks. Let's get back to Francesca. Look, this, this, first of all, do we trust fishermen? I mean, or, or is it simply that there's, that there's a number of people that, that, that don't keep accurate logbooks, don't submit accurate information, have bad practices, such as those that Brian has, has suggested, and it sort of contaminates, you know, the bad apples contaminate the, the whole. Do we trust fishermen to provide information or do we think they have to be commanded and controlled in some way? Well, uh, I think, I mean, we can only base ourselves based on the data we have today. Um, what we know uh, so far um, is that, I mean, the evidence we have is that uh, the lending obligation is currently not implemented. Huh? Uh, and that has, I mean, clearly been said by, by the other speakers today. Uh, there is a great incentive not to apply the lending obligation and to keep discarding uh, fish at sea. Of course, I mean, we can't, we can't compare all fisheries. We can't compare all fishermen, as, as Brian said. The situation is different uh, depending on the sea basins, depending on what you catch. But overall, from the information we have, uh, there is clearly evidence that discarding is still taking place at sea to a large extent, and that uh, the member states today are not applying effective control measures to implement it, to control it, to implement it, and to enforce it. Of course, as long as you don't have effective control and monitoring, it is very difficult to imagine that the lending obligation will be fully implemented one day. Brian, it's a bit difficult for me to ask you to put your put yourself in the position of of uh, fishers who are are not obeying the rules. But but what's the motivation? I suppose it's simply uh, you know we're we're not bothering to comply with the landing obligation because you know there's no value in the fish. We want to get the best profit. Other fishermen aren't obeying the rules. The government is in, in enforcing the rules. I mean, don't is there is there, is there no sort of moral ethical concern about the waste of course there is chris i mean you hit the bottom line rightly i think as i think it was bill clinton said it's all about the economy stupid uh fishermen are out there to make a profit i mean fishermen are also fishermen because they want to be fishermen it's a way of life that they've chosen it's a way of life that their fathers may have had before them so there's a whole tradition that goes with fishing but it's now is not the place to talk about all of that but this issue of trust i think is 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 crucial and and there is a lack of trust i think on both sides fishermen mistrust what will be done with the information they provide if they provide it the authorities mistrust the fishermen so yes i mean i think there is a very strong case to be made for uh, a process of of trust building i mean this is what uh, the discussions that I've been having and others have been having with the Commission uh, over the last uh, six, seven years since the uh, 2014 policy uh, came into being, is that it's not about uh, hitting the fishermen with a big stick. It's about having a bit of carrot, a bit of stick, trust building, and what's loosely described as a culture of compliance. I mean, that is what we're well, trying to work well, I, have to, I have to put it to you that Europesh, the voice of the uh, like the larger operators, say there is a culture of compliance. Their website says so. 
Uh, EU fishers are champions. EU fishers are champions of responsible fishing. You, 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 you seem to be as you know someone. So everything's all right then. Great, fantastic. <laughs> you, you, no problem. So that's end of the discussion, Chris. Well, Yannicka, can I just ask when it comes to this this landing obligation, the, you know, the discard ban, is there still public concern about it? I mean. You've heard. I mean, you heard the arguments. The fish, at the moment, there isn't a there isn't a value to be placed on the fish when it's landed. There isn't a use to which it may be put. Um, I mean, do, do 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 you think there's better understanding now that the fishermen are, are fishing for commercial reasons, and that's how it is? Well, yes and no. Um, I don't think any fisher fisher wakes up in the morning and goes to sea saying. Uh, I'm going to make sure that this sector dies within the next 15 years. Uh, that's not the incentive. I think it's more also about a cultural uh, shift that we need. As was mentioned, um, fishing is normally a, a very traditional way of work, especially when we talk, talk about the small scale ones. Um, and the fact is, we have a lot more fishers today than we used to have, and the fish stocks are declining. Uh, we have a lot more people as well. Uh, to produce this fish food for. So the equation of, of just keeping things as they were doesn't work anymore. Um, I don't think it's ill will directly, but it is a business. And everyone who's run a business ever knows that you have to balance the sides of the budget. So uh, that's especially where this comes in. If, if something is cheaper to do for the fishers and there's not enough incentive, and on the other hand, not enough stick, then, then that's how it will go. Um, this is why I think it's interesting to think about the CCTV, which is, has proven to be quite a good way to see what is being landed. Uh, and it's not used today as widely as it could be. And okay. there's some good, I'm just oh. going to tell you, I, I'm wrapping up. Um, there's been, um, uh, when you look at the data collected in fisher, by fishers and, and uh, on fishing boats, whenever there is an observer on the boat, uh, the data is completely different. Suddenly you have the small species, you have the undersized species compared to when the same boat doesn't have an observer. Now I'm talking generally speaking uh, on the fishing sector. Um, we can't have observers on the boats all the time. Uh, that's expensive and that's uh, impossible. We could start to work towards, so what was mentioned earlier about the CCTVs and, and having that uh, connected to a remote electronic system to, to have the observer effect there. Just, I'll just pick you up on one point before moving on to Francesca and, and cameras. Um, and that, that's the point where you made, suggested that uh, we were overfishing, we were still fish stocks were declining. Globally, I don't disagree with you, but uh, I think you have to have to admit that the commercial stocks are in a much better state than they were a decade ago now around the, the around Europe. Around Europe, yes. Okay. In some sense, right. Chris, I think if you look at the Mediterranean and the Baltic, that's not the case. Uh, yeah, and the Black Sea. Um, and indeed, watch, yeah. the, watch the next programme, which I think is in the first week of May, where we'll be discussing that, that very issue. And now, also, I would disagree that there are, there are more fishermen. There's maybe more fishing going on. We've had what's known as technical creep, but over the last 20, 30 years, the fishing industry has declined in terms of number of boats and number of fishermen out there at sea. But the power and capacity of vessels to fish, more fish, has increased. And so, yes, there's more fishing, but less fishermen and less fishing boats. So, Francesca, um, the cameras, that's one of the that's that's been seen as one of the answers to uh, to ensure that the landing obligation is enforced, to, to ensure we get the proper information, to putting cameras on boats to see to uh, so that fishermen know that, you know, bad practices will not go unobserved. Yes, indeed. I mean, this is what the Commission proposed already three years ago. There is already there is a possibility to use cameras today. Yeah? This is provided by the CFP when the landing obligation was introduced. The member states were clearly told, uh, required to uh, apply effective control, including through the use of cameras. Unfortunately, this hasn't happened so far. Uh, um, it, it is in a way understandable that uh, if member states and also the industry, I mean, accept the cameras, uh, this is done at the same time and equally for everybody. It shouldn't be just for one member state or one region or one fishing fleet. So that's the reason why when the, we uh, presented a review and a proposal for a comprehensive review of the fisheries control system, 
in the EU, and that was back in May 2018, the Commission came up with uh, a proposal to effectively control the language of regulation through the use and installation of cameras on board matched with remote electronic monitoring systems. Uh, of course, we, we were also aware that we couldn't uh, think of uh, installing cameras on each and every vessel, I mean, of the large EU fleet, and not all vessels bear the same risks. So what we had proposed was to limit the installation of cameras only to high-risk vessels based on a methodology which has been defined by the European Fisheries Control Agency. So the proposal by the Commission is there, and as you rightly pointed out at the beginning of your intervention, uh, this is uh, uh, currently being debated by the two co-legislators, by the European Parliament and by the Council. Yeah, but um, Europesh, the, again, the, the voice of the, uh, the major fishing industry, if you like, the fishing sector, says this proposal is about intrusive control. It ignores data protection and business confidentiality, and it goes against workers' rights. I mean, those are pretty damning criticisms, are they not? Yeah, but this is this is not new. Uh, we are we are. I mean, um, the fact that it's not new doesn't mean it's not. It's it's it's, it's not new, but it's a criticism uh, which uh, I mean uh, can be uh, um, which is uh, which is, has no reason to be uh, to be uh, let's say put forward. And I tell you for three main reasons: eh? the where, the where, the what, uh, and and the why. First of all. Uh, we are not thinking of placing cameras in private areas of a boat. Uh, we were never thinking of putting cameras in uh, sleeping areas, in the kitchens, or let alone in the toilets. Huh? So the cameras would only be placed in uh, areas where the catch is handled, is put on board, is placed on board, and can be uh, can be handled. So that's the what you are where you are filming private life of uh, of people, because nobody would be at least the authorities that will have access to those footages will never see who is behind the camera. So that's the the what and and third the how. Uh, nobody said, and we never said in our proposal, that the videos will be placed on YouTube. The videos will only be available upon request to the authorities and to the fisheries control authorities, and exclusively and uniquely for fisheries control purposes. So, for these three reasons, so the, where the cameras are placed and what they're filming and how the footages will be treated, I don't think that there will be any issue uh, with data protection. Well, you know, I mean, cameras have been fitted before. I think I think I'm right in saying the Scottish White Fish Fleet had cameras for a while, and they got extra quota, I think, while they were trying this out. But I, I, I hope you can tell us that the, where there have been and where cameras are used in uh, across the world, they've had uh, success in, in ensuring that we get better information and better controls. Is that the case? Yes, uh, that's the case. It's uh, first of all, it's not a new technology, and uh, it has been introduced by by other countries around the world. Not necessary to control the landing obligation, and eh? landing obligation is not a policy or the discard ban, which is uh, widely has been uh, um, widely implemented uh, um, uh, by uh, by by other third countries. But cameras are, for example, for example, widely used in certain fisheries for. For control to control the uh, the catches of sensitive species, for example, bycatches, and this is another uh, great advantage of having cameras on board. You don't just have the possibility to better ascertain whether or not there were illegal discarding events. There can be much better information on the uptake and catches of sensitive species, also for scientific purposes. You can also control illegal transshipments, for example, taking place. So there are many more uh, benefits of, of, of cameras than just the landing obligation. But coming back to your question, yes, there are examples of using cameras, for example, in New Zealand, in Australia, in Chile, for example, they have used cameras even on small scale vessels. Just touching on small scale, Brian, uh, I see in, in Denmark there's a number of small small scale under 12 metre vessels that have got cameras because they 
I think to protect harbour porpoises or to fish in areas where there are harbour porpoises and things. So even small vessels sometimes have, have cameras fitted. Yeah, I mean, it's a question of finding a means of fitting them on a small boat where they're not going to interfere with the fishing operation or make the work uh, difficult. I have even seen them uh, used in research projects, small GoPro cameras fitted on bobble hats, monitoring the fish as it comes in over the net well, border. So, uh, yeah, we'll skip. yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, do it again. Can be done. Do a regare for a skier, isn't it, to have a camera <laughs> for their, their hat? That kind of thing. And using fish identification technology. So you can use, uh, like, these facial re recognition technologies. You can apply to fish uh, as you do to birds and plants. You can get apps on your mobile phone which can identify the fish species for you. And I think, Francesca, you're, you're taking – it's not just about cameras. It is about this other electronic, you know, recognition yeah. technology too. It's much more than cameras. I mean, a camera per se uh, is not sufficient. You need to have a whole set of, I mean, the technology that is combined to the cameras. You may also have sensors uh, that are used in combinations with cameras to identify possible instances of uh, discarding events. And above everything, you need to have a computer vision technology uh, used uh, by, uh, by the authorities uh, like the one that Brian was mentioning, the facial recognition, there are a number of uh, studies and projects being carried out by the member states for scientific purposes. I think we saw one in the parliament recently presented by the Netherlands uh, uh, with the promising results uh, that is using artificial intelligence. So uh, unfortunately, this artificial intelligence has not been so far so much i mean much implemented in the in the fishing industry but the, the technology is there and is being used in many other sectors so it, it is definitely promising thank you just um tell me is it the case if i recall correctly when the landing obligation was was introduced fishers were given an increased quota because they were being required to land all the fish they would otherwise discard do they still get an increased quota despite the fact that the landing obligation is not being respected? Um, maybe it's not a question. Maybe, maybe, yeah, sorry, Valerie. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, um, so in the, indeed, as Francesca said before, we, we changed from a system whereby it was based on the landings to it being based on catches. So th there's indeed a difference. Over time, the situation has now changed with the full rollout of the landing obligation is that where before member states were getting the so-called top-ups uh, to deal with with that difference now it's i i hear the answer but i don't understand it um <laughs> do, do are fishermen getting an increased quota because they're supposed to be complying with the landing obligation but they're not uh yes i think well no not anymore but the well, the well, quota was increased are they, the are they not, if they're not if are they not if they're not getting it anymore that's that's okay but uh you know, if they, given the landing obligation is not being respected, if they are have had an increased quota, then, you know, that uh, is un undermining everything we're trying to achieve, isn't it? Yeah. And um, couldn't, well, okay, we, 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 I just, because it just seems to me, I mean, Francesca, bringing Francesca here, I mean, you want an incentive to, 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 for fishermen to, to, to install cameras so that you're, you're, you're bringing them with you rather than you're fighting them. Um, surely, you know, an increased quota in return for fitting of cameras and in, in return for having, you know, 100 percent accurate information. I mean, that's a that's a reasonable incentive, is it not? Uh, yes, and there's there's ways of looking at that uh, on, on how you can incentivize specifically for those that comply with 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 uh, pilot projects and all that. Currently, as I say, the situation is such that the quotas are set on the basis of scientific advice. So on the reality, what is the state of the stock? What is the quota? And currently, uh, the introduction of the landing obligation, there was a transition. But now we are there that we are basing it on scientific advice. So. Uh, that's the reality. So it's not about who complies or who does not comply. That's the reality of the best available knowledge we have. And then when member states ask for, for the exemptions, they have to come up with the justifications which are scientifically assessed. So it's 
it's a different uh, process compared to uh, pure what is happening in terms of compliance, but it's science-based what we're, we're doing in terms of the allocations. Thank you. Francesca, one last question before, before we sort of come to a wind up on, on, on this. And it's just about the, the monitoring of, of engine power of vessels. Oh. Um, because the, the Commission presented a report to uh, the European Parliament's Fisheries Committee when I was chair back in 2019, which yes. highlighted the fact, well, it revealed the, the fact that manufacturers were quite deliberately falsifying the engine power of, their, of the engines, actually underplaying how powerful they were with the consent of the people who are buying their engines, you know, because, because there's regulations on how powerful that vessel can be because that, uh, that, that affects the degree to which that boat is capable of catching fish and what fishing grounds it can, it can reach in a day and, and, and such like. And so there was actual falsification of this, 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 this data and member states, governments were, were, were doing nothing to enforce the rules. So are you, what are you proposing? What do you think you can do about this? Because it was, it was shameful. Well, uh, Chris, I think this was the reaction. I mean, not, not only your reaction in terms of the results of the study. Uh, we are doing several things. I mean, uh, in the first place, we are trying to change the rules uh, for engine power monitoring to, I mean, to make it more simple and easier for the member states uh, to verify the, uh, the actual engine power use. And no surprise there, we are proposing a continuous monitoring of, uh, of engine power, again, recurring to new technologies uh, for, for engine power. There isn't much buy-in of, of this proposal by the Commission, I have to say, unfortunately. On the other hand... By, uh, by, the, we, by, by governments, do you mean? By the yeah, in, in general, also by, by the operators. Huh? I mean, there is, uh, I mean, this, there, the, the, the fact of monitoring engine power is not well uh, accepted, uh, which in a way uh, is an indication of the fact that in many cases uh, the, uh, the engine power declared in the, in the fishing license perhaps uh, is not the correct one. Uh, but secondly, I mean, we can't just think of what the legislation will be in two, three, maybe four years time, we still don't know. We are also working in parallel with all member states to make sure that they reinforce their controls and their verification of engine power right now. Okay, right, look, um, we're coming to the end of our hour. So let me just uh, ask uh, contributors here about the landing obligation, about what needs to be done. Pos positive thoughts. Um, Jan um, Janika, come to, you, come to you first. What needs to be done to ensure that this landing obligation is respected, or at least if it's not going to be respected, if, it's, if it simply is unworkable and there is no point landing fish for which there's no, there's, there's no use. You know, the object of the game is sustainability. That, that's number one. Build up, rebuild fish stocks, ensure we have a successful uh, fishing industry for the future, which depends on having those, those fish stocks. What needs to be done? So I, I still think that the landing obligation is good. It needs to be implemented. And as I said in the beginning, uh, we have to start with the common starting ground, and that's the fact that we all want to fish still after 50 years and more. Um, I think we need to continue developing these things together with the fishing sector, both uh, the, the small scale that Brian is representing here today, but also the, the large scale fishing sector. Um, uh, and, you know, we, I, we just heard about the CCTV and the monitoring and how there's um, possibly... Uh, and show how much you're catching of which species by having a surveillance on board that, that can recognize these species, then you can show the actual amount of the, the choke species, so to say, and, and work on that so that if you're not catching it as much, then you can continue with the other fishers in, in a mixed fishing uh, effort. Um, and going forward, what I would like to see uh, also is uh, having other biodiversity recorded so we are now only talking about uh, catches of fish which are under quotas, but it would be very good to see as well um, where we catch cedar turtles, porpoises, uh, other species like this, this to, to uh, have this data recorded on a species level for future assessments. We need to be sure, fishers obviously, fishermen need, need to know that we want the information because that information can help rebuild fish stocks ultimately. But they need to know also that by providing that information, they're not going to put themselves at risk of being penalised in some way. Obviously, I mean, who, who, would, who would do that? Who, who would give information if you're going to get punished for it? Yeah. Brian, any thoughts on, on where we go from here? 
Well, I'm a landing obligation skeptic, I confess. Um, it's not working. Um, I'm not sure how it can be made to work properly. Uh, from a small scale fisheries point of view and, and generally, I think the selectivity has to be done in the water, not uh, on, on land. Uh, basically, the landing obligation has become shifting, uh, uh, dumping your unwanted fish, whether it's undersized, not economic, uh, over quota, whatever, uh, rather than dumping it in the sea, you're bringing it ashore to put it in landfill. I think the markets that were mentioned earlier on in the discussion, in most cases, uh, in most practical situations, aren't workable for the bycatch that is landed. Sure, some of it can go to fish meal, but the logistics of getting all fish to fish meal or to alternative markets simply uh, isn't there. So for me, it has to be done uh, in the water. Trawls have to be made more selective. And I think also uh, where there is a high risk, we talked about risk assessment, where there is a, is a high risk of bycatch, of disturbing spawning aggregations, then the fishing boats that are fishing in the least selective ways have to be moved away from those areas to different fishing grounds. Thank you. Valerie, discussions, I mean, you're going to get before very long. Uh, you, I mean, you've got to look at this landing obligation again. There's a control regulation to be debated, but the, the commissioner this hearing said he wanted to ensure the landing obligation was 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 properly enforced. The commission has got to review it. It's going to have to. It, it is already recognizing that it's not working. So what are you going to do about it? Well, uh, so we have next end of next year, we have the, the report on the common fisheries policy coming and that will look at the overall of how the policy is being implemented. And so the landing obligation is one one important part in that. And so we have several studies ongoing. And what I think really needs to happen towards that report, a lot of it comes down also to how we make the regionalization work uh, under the CFP, how we get uh, both the collaboration between the industry and other stakeholders and the member states closer, uh, closer together between them, but also cl closer to the realities in the sea basins. And when it comes to the landing obligation as such, uh, it's, it's very much to see what can make it work? The ultimate aim is not so much the landing obligation, but it is uh, the sustainability which we keep in mind. And so it's not only about selectivity, it's also uh, finding different ways depending on the sea basin on more flexible use of where people fish and how people fish to avoid sensitive areas. There's also uh, a whole strand of looking at uh, the allocation of the quotas, not just the allocation within member states, but also the use of the quotas or the exchanges and the swaps between member states to really adapt to the needs and the realities. So a lot of it comes down to knowing better and knowing more. And uh, our aim at the moment is to be sure that we we get the best picture. We have discussions in 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 the, in the month to come, so that when we come with the report, we we can really see how what are the triggers that we need to make sure that the implementation is more successful on the areas where we see the challenges. Can you name one government in Europe which is doing perhaps more than others? to implement the lending obligation? One government in Europe, I think. Well, yeah, I, I, 27 member states, not all of the fishing nations, of course. You know, uh, is, it, is anyone doing anything? Uh, I think they are all doing certain things, as well as the sector, because of course there's a lot of negative about the sec sector and all that. But I think we've seen very good uh, trials. We've seen a lot of studies and working together on that. So it's it's more a matter of getting them closer and working together for each sea, sea base and then listing one that is the best uh, pupil in, in it all. Well, thank you. Uh, for those listening, we've come to the end of our hour. We're going to have a session now to discuss some of the contributions that we made and questions that have been uh, dialed in. Um, but for the moment, for those of you who are going to leave, before you do, I want to thank our participants. That's from the European Commission, Valerie Tanking and Francesca Arena from uh, Life to, to Press, which is a fascinating exchange and some uh, some well-known um, contributors and, and uh and uh, representatives of the fishing industry uh, take, taking part in it. Many of them chatting, as far as I can see, amongst themselves, sometimes in Spanish, which doesn't help me, uh, <laughs> rather than putting specific questions. 
so some of the questions that have already been sent in, I think, have been touched upon. Let me put um, one here, though, about uh, the use of the, the selected gear issue, because I find you know, we want to encourage more selective gear. I mean, that's the that's the sort of the, the ideal solution to it. If fishermen could actually just just get the fish they want to catch, you know, everything would be perfect. Um, there is an argument to say, on the one hand, we need command and control. We need, you know, regulations to insist upon what gear is used. On the other hand, people are saying we need less command and control. We need fishermen to be able to adjust more to particular circumstances. How, how on earth? I mean, I don't know whether it's Francesco or, or Valerie, but how do, how do you strike a balance here? It's a good question <laughs> to strike a balance. Well, I think they, the, there needs to be enough flexibility. In the end, I mean, we even see it from the studies and we're looking at the moment, for example, in the, on the implementation of the technical measures regulation, which was adopted mid-2019. Uh, and there we very much see that it's one thing to regulate which gear uh, they should use. But in the end, it's who uses the gear and knows how to use it best that makes it work. So I think it's it's a mix of how deep you go. Uh, for certain things, it's clear we, we don't want or we should prescribe either uh, at EU level, which we've done in the regulation, or region specific, which member states are doing in the regionalization. But for a number of issues, it also comes down to really the fishermen then applying it. And so there has to be a certain margin in that and a certain flexibility because it also doesn't stay the same. And the selectivity and the gear as such is only one part of a whole package of uh, how to make the fishery sustainable. So there's a whole range of different measures and to adapt those to each each reality needs some flexibility there. Yeah, but, but how do you get that flexibility? There's a question here or a point really from, from Mike Park, who uh, you will know from the Scottish whitefish, you know, as in, Pre-Brexit, I'm sure you've engaged with Mike in the, Mike in the past. Um, sensible and deliverable fisheries management will always be a challenge if we treat fishers as children in the playground. The European process of creating fisheries management is dictatorial, top-down and paternalistic. Um, well, of course... Uh, if I, mean, I can I mean, just I mean, come... To, oh, sorry. You'll come back. But, but I mean, one of the points about... One of the things we said when the common fisheries policy was being reformed was that we wanted to avoid this. We want to get away from top-down management and move towards the decentralization approach. I must say, in, in my remaining years in the European Parliament before, before Brexit, you know, I didn't notice that there'd been a fundamental shift from top to bottom. Well, the framework has fundamentally changed. Uh, so that was in 2013. But then, of course, it takes time to, to get it to be done. And a big part of where this can really work is, is when it comes down to the technical measures regulation. That regulation took a long time to negotiate. And so it's only been agreed and adopted uh, mid-2019. And member states are working together there in the regional groups to implement it. And what is really foreseen there in the co-decided act is for each region specifically what are the measures that are needed in terms of uh, technical measures for fisheries and the full possibility for member states and regional groups to adapt them to the reality of course based on science but we, what we're seeing now is that process is starting of course the regulation took time and I mean these things always take time but the shift of going from top down to more bottom up is is happening it's just not something that happens overnight, huh? in, not in the EU, and certainly not for an area so complex as fisheries. Brian, I take it you'd like it to be very, very low level, and very sensitive, very, very, very you know, individualistic, each fishing ground to be managed in its own way. Or am I being simplistic here? Sorry, Brian? Sorry, you were breaking up and Valerie was breaking up. I didn't catch uh, okay, what, was, I, what was being I, said there. I was just wondering whether whether when we consider the top ground approach, for, uh, the low impact fishers, the small scale fishers would presume like a very, very low level management approach. Both. Well, what in, in, in life, what we are pushing for, if you like, is a co-management approach, not a low level management approach but a different approach, which uh, includes the fishers more as, as partners in the management, uh, providing their own data, putting together management plans together with the authorities, 
and building really uh, this trust we, we talked about earlier between authorities and fishermen uh, and managing, I mean, we, we talk about defined areas. I mean, essentially fishing goes on, uh, small scale fishing goes on within the three to six mile zone, I mean, with, with notable exceptions. So we're talking about areas which can be restricted only for small scale uh, selective fishing practices you can manage it because uh, you have responsibility, but you also have rights and duties. And if you're only given the, the rights and duties and responsibilities without the power to implement those rights and duties, then it's not really uh, uh, bottom up. It's not really equal management. Yeah, Nika, let me, let me uh, be unfair and ask you to defend the entire environmentalist movement, because um, you know, when it comes to the issue of sustainability and, and catches, uh, on the one hand, the Commission says 99% of all fish that is landed for commercial purposes is now coming from sustainable sources. Um, and, you know, the, and yet the, the environmentalists keep saying we are overfishing this and we're ignoring the scientific evidence of the European Union is ignoring it. Jonathan Hughes here sends in a point saying 60% of quotas are set above advice. Well, from the figures I've seen, that's just not the case. I see the, I see the, th the tables. It gives the ISIS the scientific advice and it gives what the commission's recommended. It gives the final outcome. And there's a few variations for particular purposes, but it's nothing like that. Why do, why do, why do environmentalists not pay a bit more credit to the, the, fish, the, what the fishing industry and the European Union collectively have, have done in the last 10, 15 years, which is to significantly improve the situation? Okay, thanks, Chris, for um, making me the spokesperson of all the environmentalists. It's not at all daunting. Um, I'll try to, to uh, accept the challenge. Um, there is a huge pressure from the fishing industry to keep up fishing uh, with the minimal cost. Unfortunately, uh, the situation we have to have today means that we ha it, it will cost to make fishing sustainable. There's no way around it. Um, so so that's that's the first discrepancy. And then we need to have the other voice in the room pushing towards this, saying that, no, we actually need to work towards this way. Um, you touched upon how um, the scientific advice is set and that it's followed mostly. Yes, I agree. The scientific advice that is set is mostly followed. There is an underlying issue with the scientific advice because that is based on the data that we have and as already cover the data that we have is not good enough so we would like to see all the environmentalists would like to see a more precautionary approach for this uh, because if we are unsure of how much we have you know how much money we have in the bank we shouldn't spend more than we think we have or we shouldn't spend the amount we think we have we should spend less so in summing up this is kind of the approach why we keep tooting the horn on, on this issue having said that on a personal level i must say that i am glad to see things are improving and they're not just improving as fast as we'd like to see them and um, sometimes I feel like the, um, the vision is not far enough in the future it's only uh, a few decades or so with the way we're fishing right now. Um, Francesca on this issue of control I, I mean I think some I, I, if I put my personal hat on, I, th I, 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 I see no reason why cameras should not be put on boats if, if we to encourage best practice. You see cameras everywhere. Drive, drivers have tachographs, cameras in warehouses and factories. It's just, you know, that's, that's and, and whose fish is it anyway? It's the public's fish and we give fishermen a license to, 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 to catch. So there's no, re you know, all those arguments. But then we come on to something like the, the engine controls, where I see fraudulent practices being exposed and yet resistance to trying to control those fraudulent practices. And yet, so I, I, I'm with you in saying we need to stop these bad practices. And yet they all seem to be hitting the fishing industry, requiring things of fishermen, rather than encouraging fishermen to buy into best practice. Are there, are, can't we find better ways of incentivizing fishermen to, to do what's good for them and what's good for their industry? Yeah, but I think we shouldn't underestimate the power of cameras uh, to, uh, for example, for to find best practices and to explore best practices. 
I remember a presentation I had uh, seen years ago on the pilot projects in, in the UK, I think it was in Scotland, on the, uh, on the use of cameras. And one of the key outcomes uh, of, of uh, those pilot projects was that fishermen started uh, to change their fishing practices just because they had cameras on board. So they moved to new fishing grounds. They moved to new fishing grounds because they, they had already reached their quotas on board because they were fishing for too many uh, catches, some I mean, specimens below minimum size. Uh, so they, I think we shouldn't see cameras just as, as a, merely as a control tool. It is, uh, it, and it is a monitoring tool, but it is a monitoring tool that will also push and prompt fishermen to change the way they practice the fishing at sea. Yeah, okay. But um, I, I'd still be nice to find incentives. Mike Park has come back and said the fitness, the, 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 when they put cameras well, on the boats in Scotland, they, got, they, got extra, they were allowed extra days at sea. As yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's true. I mean, that was a pilot project, and a landing obligation wasn't there. Uh, I think we, we should we should I mean uh, consider that uh, I mean in many of the rules we face every day, and we have to apply every day, including control rules. Uh, do we have incentives? I mean, do we have alternatives every day when we are told do this and do that and put on your masks uh, mask now when you go out? I don't have an incentive to do that. Don't die. But I should, yeah, you know. Uh, but apart from that, I think that there is another issue that we didn't touch upon. Um, uh, and I think it, it's, it, it is closely linked to the bottom-up approach and the co-management approach that Brian raised. If you want to have a, ma a common management approach and a trustful relationship, you need to be transparent. Mm -hmm. There has to be transparency and full accountability. This is what we do not have today. And this is what I would like to see more. Okay, well, you say that. But um, there's a, uh, someone's just sent in a point saying, that the fish that the member states do not have to provide they don't have to make public the information about what they're doing to control fishing activities or to uh, carry out in aggregated on an aggregated level including data coming from the european fisheries control authorities what the member states cannot do they cannot publish data on a vessel based level they cannot publish sanctions for example on for for single owners Why? I mean, it, well uh would you like, for example, that, I mean, if you if you are fined that the data uh, is, is published, is publicly available for, I mean, for anything that you have committed or a sanction? I mean, this is this is uh, normal. I mean, data protection rules. Huh? I, I well, really don't know. I, I, I don't know any sector and any area where this data is publicly available normally. Are you referring to sanctions, Chris, or are you referring to something di different? Well, I'm, I'm not quite sure because the question's a, a bit vague. So, um, so I, I can't I can't pick you up on that, but I'm sure I'm sure others will. All I know is, but you've just argued the point for transparency, and it seems to me there are instances where there for is me, not sufficient transparency on the part of member states. And it's you know it's it is it is very convenient for some governments to 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 to, to not make some information public. That's all. Uh, well, what I, what I was referring to, I mean, when I referred to transparency, is transparency of what happens at sea transparency on the side of uh, you know the fishing operators and the fishing industry there is very little transparency and we don't know to a great extent what happens at sea valerie landing obligation discard ban iceland norway are often mentioned because they in theory i think have bans in place are they are, are they effective i've often heard people say where well, there's a discard ban in norway but no one really pays any notice of it yeah, I'm uh, well. I I'm not the expert there, so I'm I'm not going to go into too much detail. The I know in terms of Norway, of course, they already had the landing obligation in place before we started, and it has been very much a source of inspiration. But their fisheries is very very different. So the reality of the landing obligation uh, for the Norwegian fisheries is surely not the same if you if you look at the mixed fishery we have in certain areas. So uh, and how effective it is, I I, I personally I don't know in, in yeah. Norway or Iceland, but it's th those policies exist. It's just each fishery is different there as well. Okay, well, this is not a question any of you can 
answer, uh, although Brian will no doubt uh, have a good go at it. But why don't member states allocate it? At, why do member states give such a very small proportion of their total quota to, to the low impact fishers, to the small scale people? Well, there's a historical reason, Chris, which you, you probably know, which is up until I think it was uh, 2012, uh, the small scale sector were not bound by quota. They could basically catch anything they were able to. But then the, um, the regulation on, uh, I think, it buyers and sellers uh, regulation, that changed, which meant that the person buying the fish from the fisherman had to have some kind of certificate which showed the fish that he was buying was being caught legally. So that then said, well, how can small scale fishers show that the fish they're catching is being caught legally if they don't have to fill in a logbook, if they don't have to declare their catch, if they don't actually have a quota? So that more or less forced the quota system onto the small scale sector who had no historical track record because they didn't have to declare their catches. So they were caught in a kind of catch 22, having no quota, having no ability to show they had a track record because the reference period was before they had to declare their catches. So they were caught in this uh, rock and a hard place generally and were forced onto having to fish for non-quota species. So the quota having already been allocated, and we've seen legal cases, uh, notably in the UK, um, about how quota is uh, distributed uh, coming up, and basically governments being um, powerless to do anything about it. I think the only successful case I've heard about is a case that was brought in the UK uh, against the government by the uh, larger scale POs on uh, quota uplift, basically skimming off what uh, producer organizations weren't using in a year and allocating it to the small scale sector. That was the only successful thing. But the whole Article 17 um, has been a big disappointment, partly because nobody has come up with a workable definition of what is a social, environmental, or uh, economic criteria, and which should have the priority. Should environmental criteria trump social criteria or which should have priority and nobody has any responsibility so again i mean we're optimistic that the 2022 uh, uh, report on the implementation of the cfp will come up with some proposals of how article 17 can be made fit for purpose and actually be implemented i hope you've got a position paper ready <laughs> well <laughs> yes let's go for it <laughs> Tell me, um, one thing we haven't touched upon is, is amongst the reasons why uh, the discard ban may be ignored, why discard by uncatching a haddock without revealing the fact that you've, I mean, is that the case? That without revealing the fact that uh, uh, you've actually, uh, you're actually exceeding the limit in the amount you're, you're catching. Now, this is thrown, thrown out all the time that the discarding has to continue in order to, to stop choke species, but I, I don't see how it promotes sustainability in any way at all. Um, Yannicka, is this a real issue? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I think if we could uh, have better information on what we're actually um, fishing, lifting out of the sea, uh, in those cases where we cannot use selective gear for one reason or another, then we could work on this choke species issue. At the current uh, situation with the Eastern Baltic cod is that you're not allowed to catch it. There's zero quota for it, but there is a bycatch quota so that it won't become a choke species for, for mixed fisheries. Yeah. And, and, and um, but, but Val Valerie, you must be having, having this thrown at you all the time because it's, uh, you know, choke, it's the, the industry is always saying, ah, choke species, choke species. But then I, other, I keep reading accounts saying, actually, we've managed to avoid most of the problems of choke species by sharing, distrib redistributing quota or, or what have you. Yeah, I think the, the issue of choke is, of course, different if you look at the individual vessels or fleets or if you look at uh, EU-wide. But so in for when it comes to setting the fishing opportunities, we have seen a few cases only. And there, when it comes to the bycatch quotas, those are based on the advice we get from the scientists about what is really the unavoidable catch. Uh, so not about what people don't want, but really what is unavoidable. So that's, that we do on that basis. But... 
indeed the flexibility at at the member state level uh, in between the sectors. You have the producer organizations, which have a key role to play there for a lot of fisheries in finding a more flexible way of using quotas. Uh, there's the swapping between member states. So there are tools available to make that happen, but uh, yeah, it depends a bit on, on where you are. What's the reality? Yeah? So can I ask for a bit of speculation here? Um, Francesca, you're at some point, at some point in the next so many months, I expect you believe that trilogue negotiations will, will, will start between the Parliament and the, and the yes. Council over the uh, control regulation. Yes. Where do you feel, I mean, are you going to make progress? Are the Commission going to be pushing very hard for its original proposals or is it going to be adapting them? Well, I mean, the Commission, uh, as usual, is uh, is um, defending its its proposal and it's defending the principle behind its proposal. Of course, I mean, the proposal can have different shapes at the end and the co-legislators will define which would be the final shape. But the, the key principle for us is to having uh, the tools and effective uh, and robust control tools to monitor, control and enforce the landing obligation. I have to say that I'm quite hopeful uh, right now, having seen the uh, result of the uh, vote in the parliament, in the plenary, that acknowledge actually that there is a need to, uh, to install cameras and use remote electronic monitoring to, uh, to better control the landing obligation. Uh, that was quite uh, a key outcome eh, of the vote of the March plenary meeting in the parliament. Yeah, I see from the Europesh website that uh, there was complaints that the democratic role of the European Parliament's Fisheries Committee was undermined by the Commission, who appealed selectively to members of the Environment Committee in the same Parliament um, and appealed to them to, to put sustainability and, and, and such like first and succeeded in swinging the vote in the Parliament by, by, by seven or something. Um, I'm not quite sure why the Commission shouldn't do this. It seems perfectly reasonable to it right to members of the European Parliament, but uh, you're obviously being heavily criticised. And when you come to the, when, and, and whatever the influence in the Parliament, there's bound to be some governments who are listening to the fishing industry and saying, we don't want compulsory cameras. And if you want to get your proposals through, you're going to presumably try to facilitate agreement by suggesting some sort of incentive for cameras to be to be fitted, you know, in order to, to give the politicians some room for manoeuvres, some room to agree with you. There are already incentives. I mean, there is something we didn't mention, eh, which are economic incentives. Uh, they're uh, enshrined into the new uh, European Maritime and Fisheries Fund. There are incentives. I mean, if, if the issue, for example, is uh, who's going to pay for the cameras, uh, the new fund will provide incentives to install and, and do maintenance of the cameras. So, so at least the economic part of it is already tackled and addressed in a way or another. Um, more, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't anticipate, uh, I mean, where this discussion and the trilogues and the political, you know, negotiation will bring. Uh, but one thing for me is clear, Chris, uh, there is an issue of political credibility for the legislators. I mean, the same legislators that adopted in 2013 the new CFP, and uh, decided to move uh, to a discard ban to the lending obligation will have in a way or another to create the conditions to control that policy. Uh, so I think that there we, we have an issue of credibility at political level. And then there is the, the request of transparency that is coming from the citizens and from consumers more and more. I see it, uh, I've been- I don't know, a summary of views really. <laughs> Yannick had mentioned um, fishing pressures and overfishing. And of course, globally, we know the situation is, 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 is not good. Um, I think uh, in the Europe around the Atlantic waters of the European Union, much progress has been made of late. But we're still nothing like back to the situation we were, you know, 50 or 60 years ago in terms of uh, uh, the biomass of, uh, of fish, fish in our seas. Um, but there's also talk about greater protection for marine protected areas and, 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 and the like. And, it all seems terribly slow, but uh, you know, I would, I think the trend is going the right direction for both the fishing industry and for uh, conservation and the future of our marine environment. Are you optimistic 
or pessimistic? Who should we go for? Valerie? I'm very I optimistic, actually. I think we have the right uh, frameworks in place. We have the right uh, tools that are there. It's a matter of making it work. And we see a trend, and it's more about making it now real and indeed maybe going faster. Uh, I think uh, we're, we're in a good place. So, yeah, hugely optimistic. I think we can do it. It's just a matter of doing it all together and going there. Yannicka, pessimistic, optimistic? Carefully optimistic. And I agree with Valerie <laughs> on the fact that we need to make it move faster. Um, the marine spatial plans are a tool that we could use here. The deadline was uh, two weeks ago and six member states only had their plans in place in time, which is below par for a directive, uh, for an EU directive. So, and this would help us look at the sea in a general way. So these kind of things, they're there. Let's use them so that we can get faster and, and, and get to the goal we all want to go, get to. Thank you. Brian? Well, I'd like to be optimistic. I see, I listen to uh, Valerie. I share her views. The tools are there. Um, it, it can be done. But uh, woeful lack of political will. And still I see this kind of push me, pull you going on between the Commission and member states. Uh, so I think, you know, we need a better alignment between what happens here in uh, in Europe in terms of decision-making process and the responsibilities of the Commission on the one hand and the member states also taking their responsibilities seriously and implementing the policies that they are uh, voting for. That uh, I feel that, uh, and I think this will be shown by uh, uh, 2022, that member states have been woefully behind in implementing the CFP as it's meant to be implemented in the letter of the law as well as in the uh, uh, letter of the um, of, of what it's meant to be doing. Thank you. Francesca, do you disagree with your commission colleague? I, no, I don't disagree. And I have to say, I mean, uh, uh, I, mean I resisted three years, as you know, huh, uh, Chris. It's been three years that we presented our proposal to the colleges later. Uh, so the only way to resist and to endure is to be optimistic. And I continue to be optimistic. Uh, definitely what is necessary in the future is to create as well better awareness and understanding out there in the public. Uh, with the citizens and consumers. Uh, and the, uh, these events, as the one that we you organized today, I think play a big role in, in that respect. So thank you. Couldn't agree more. What, what goes on out of sight, beneath our waters, matters a great deal to the, to the future of us all. Well, I hope uh, those of you watching found that of interest. I, I, I certainly did from, uh, from my role as a, as a participant. Uh, this uh, webinar, this Blue Deal debate has been brought to you thanks to the support, sponsorship and organisation of Rudd Pedersen Public Affairs in Brussels. We're always looking for sponsors for new, there's no shortage of uh, items to discuss. Um, you also will be able to find uh, repeat viewings of, uh, of this webinar on the website called Political Festival. That should be up and running by, by tomorrow and all the back uh, webinars Blue Deal debates can be found there too. So, and if you'd like to come to us back because you want to sponsor a future debate, then then please do. So it just remains to me to, to thank our participants today. And that is from the commission, uh, heads of unit Valerie Tankink and Francesca Arena, from the European Parliament, uh, Yannicka Borg, and from Life Low Impact Fishers for Europe, that's uh, Brian O'Riordan. Thank you all, hope you enjoyed it. I did, all the best. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.